Thanks everyone for coming to this panel. Uh, oh good, we, it now says, it used to be a panel on drug policy, I think. So um, if you're, it's like on an airplane. If you're here for that, you're going to the wrong place. Go somewhere else. Uh, we're gonna talk about the economics of international broadband deployment. Um, and uh, we have uh, an ever-growing panel of experts to, to talk about this which means we each get 35 seconds to speak. So uh, what I'd like to do is just ask the panelists to quickly introduce themselves so I don't mangle their names. Uh, they'll tell you their names and their affiliation. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about them, I highly encourage you to talk to them afterward. Uh, and then we'll get started. So I'm Jeffrey Manny from the International Center for Law and Economics. Helani Galpaya from Learn Asia, a think tank working in South Asia and Southeast Asia on ICT policy and regulation questions. Christopher Yu from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in the United States. Patrick Ryan, I'm a strategy and operations principal with Google. Uh, Michael Kendi, I'm the chief economist with the Internet Society. Luf Calderwood, I'm in Oxford Brooks University and I do research on telecoms. Hi everyone, I'm Dana Raj Thakur. I'm with the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Rajat Matthews, I represent the Cellular Operators Association of India, which represents all the mobile operators in India. And I'm Vicky Worker. I'm with commercial satellite operator O3B Networks. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, and, and thank you all so much for agreeing to join us in this. Uh, also, we have two hashtags for this panel. One's just not enough. Uh, we have, uh, we encourage you to use both the IGF 2015 and the broadband hashtag. And if you use both of them, uh, you only get 105 characters. But you also will ensure that uh, everyone is participating in the same conversation. Okay. So, uh, as the, the, set up for this panel suggested, uh, I don't remember the words exactly, but something like everyone agrees that, that uh, universal broadband deployment is a good thing. And as is so common in, in so many aspects of, of the debates and the conversations that we're having here at IGF and, and in this industry generally, they're definitional questions. What does universal mean? I, I guess we could say, what does broadband mean? Uh, uh, we could even say, what does deployment mean? And too frequently, I, I think there is a tendency to sloganize a little bit. It's true, we all kind of agree a universal deployment is great, but what do we all mean by that? And um, what we wanted to do with this panel was focus in particular on the economics and the business of broadband deployment in the service of trying to define a little bit better, uh, in particular, to my mind, what universal means. So for an economist, universal never means 100%. There's no such thing as 100% in, in economics. There is always diminishing marginal cost and increasing, uh, excuse me, diminishing marginal returns and increasing marginal cost, uh, which means that at some point, it simply doesn't make sense to continue, say, for example, um, uh, deploying broadband. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to identify what is the, the sort of optimal amount of broadband, um, which also implicates questions about what is the optimal type of broadband? What are the optimal or what are the acceptable limitations on access or limitations on quality or speed or other things that would justify an increase in the amount of deployment even if it comes with, with some constraint on it? Alternatively, in what situations are we willing to sacrifice some amount of infrastructure because it may be more expensive, but we think it's supremely important that we have a certain quality of, uh, of access. We may not be able to offer that 100% of the world, but that's okay because we think we need to have at least that minimum quality level. The important thing to point out is that there are, in fact, always exactly these trade-offs. Too often we talk about fundamental rights, uh, we talk about ubiquity, we talk about 100%, we talk, about, we talk in, these, in these strong terms that are often very emotional, uh, we feel very strongly about them, but in the real world, there are always trade-offs. 
So what we want to explore in this panel is what those trade-offs are, what the sources of those trade-offs are, and uh, uh, to some extent, assuming we have some time, what sorts of policies we should be pursuing given our understanding of where those trade-offs are and where we think, how we think we should make those trade-offs, what sorts of policies we should be pursuing in order to achieve this optimal level of broadband deployment. So I'm going to start, we're going to start talking about some, some fairly basic issues here just to get on the table the, let's call it the economic way of thinking about broadband deployment. Uh, and as we go along, I'm going to ask various of the panelists, uh, based on their expertise, to delve in more detail into some of the topics we'll be discussing. So, <clears throat> the first thing that I, uh, I, I want to throw out to, to the panel is, is what I offered as a statement a little while ago is, is, a, is a question that I think will engender some interesting discussion, uh, which is, what does universal deployment mean? Uh, if you, I'm not suggesting everyone has to pick a number, 97%. That, that, of course, isn't the answer. But when you think of universal deployment, when you think of, of achieving the optimal level of, of broadband deployment around the world, how do you think about that? How should we think about that? Uh, and let's start talking a little bit about the kinds of limitations that prevent that number from ever being 100%. Christopher, please. So thank you very much for organizing this. Um, there is a standard out of the International Telecommunications Union of when, built in the telephone days, of when a country was considered universally served. It is not 100%. Because we understand that there are areas that are just going to be, the, the hyper-rural areas are going to be impossible to serve in an effective way. And they were, so that's the practical part of it, is that there are certain realities. And if you look at even the most ambitious national broadband plans, they can see that the, usually the last 1% will be reached by satellite. Um, it's not because they think that satellite has the same uh, latencies or the same bandwidth issues as, uh, provided. It's the reality that they are the best means for serving them because it would be so expensive on a per line basis that would be impossible. The second part about this though isn't just who's got service, the question is service of what quality. And what's interesting is to me is how little uh, empirical basis is usually put into defining that. It's often used for various purposes. You know, Europe has famously identified 30 megabits and 100 megabits as target thresholds. You know, one of the things that I found very interesting is this very little analysis about what usage is. And what people will often say is you have to have a certain threshold of speed. In this day and age, I think Netflix recommends eight megabits, and multi-channel, multi-party uh, conference calling on VOIP is generally 12 megabits. You know, people are making grandiose claims of the need for a gig. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, newspaper articles saying, "What do you do with a gig?" It's not entirely clear that the man is caught up with that. So what I think about this is it's not, an absolute, it's not a, a theoretical question, it's an empirical one, which is to look at how people are actually using the internet, figure out what seeds they need, and you know, some studies I've seen suggest that speeds on the order of 50, even in a multi-screen world, are sufficient. But the thing that always bugs me as well is the things you need speeds well over 10 meg for are primarily entertainment, is video. And if we want to talk about taking limited resources and using them and, and the policy levers we have available to us, it's usually talked about in being a fully participating in society, which means applying to jobs, getting services, access to government, e-health services. Generally, those are not high bandwidth items, and not like video. And in fact, what we need to do is disaggregate even not just what people need, but within that bundle, have an empirical question of what people really need to be participating members in society and define it along that way. Germany used to have a system like this, where they would look at usage, and they said if usage of a certain thing dropped below 50%, they would drop it out of the universal service bundle. Uh, the thing that was always made fun of was pay phones. In a cell phone world, no one uses them. Um, it dropped below 50% and Germany redefined it in different terms that weren't actually based on empirics anymore. And so there's always a temptation to keep them along. I think a, a more rigid empirical approach that looks at what people actually need would be a much stronger one. So I'm, I'm going to highlight a couple of things that, that Christopher said and uh, uh, just to make sure they're out there for the rest of the conversation. So, so a couple of things that I heard. Uh, no, number one, the importance of uh, of different technologies for delivering uh, broadband access. Um, some of which entail inherently 
limitations, if, if your baseline is, uh, is fiber wireline uh, uh, broadband access, um, satellite service it looks different. You can even say it looks like it's it's de uh, deprecated in in some fa in some facet. But of course, that's exactly the trade-off we're talking about. If the trade-off is between a slightly slower service, but service at all, you know, versus uh, versus nothing, uh, that's you know that's an important trade-off, and we should be very. I, I believe we should be careful about impugning these other forms of service and establishing sort of too high a, a baseline if, if the consequence of that is fewer people have service at all. Second thing that you, you mentioned that we're going to talk about more is, um, uh, is the quality of the service. And of course, that's, that's extremely important as well. And, and we definitely want to make sure that we're talking about not just the quality of the service, the speed of the service, for example, but also uh, uh, certain, you know, the, the sorts of business models, um, the kinds of, of technologies that are being used that uh, make it economically worthwhile to provide service, even though that service may look in some ways, again, as though it has some degraded quality. The most obvious thing that comes to mind would be zero-rated services. Some people would say this is a, a, you know, a cabined version of the internet, uh, but if it is some part of the internet, uh, again, where the alternative is no part of the internet, uh, for many people that's a perfectly valid trade-off and, and we should be understanding exactly where those trade-offs are. The third thing that you implied, but I don't think quite exactly discussed and that, and that uh, uh, I'm going to ask Dhanaraj to talk about uh, in just a minute, is the question of affordability. At what price are we offering the service? It's one thing to have service available. Uh, it's another thing that that service be uh, available at a price that people can actually use and, and, and that also is an important trade-off to consider and implicates exactly uh, both the, the technology being used to offer the service and the types of business models that may be facilitating making the economic uh, calculation make sense. So with that lead up, Patrick, do you want to jump in there and talk about the technology in particular? If you, Thank you, yes. But do, talk about whatever you want. I, I do have some comments. I appreciate that. Thank you. I wanted to, I wanted to weigh in on a couple of things. One of the uh, first is to make a pitch. Uh, for a for a paper that that we're that we're working on that proposes an idea um, that would hopefully lead to more measurement. Uh, Christopher mentioned the, the lack of available information about the quality of services around the world, and that's a real problem. We agree. Who has that information? Well, primarily the private sector has that information. Companies like ours and others, and we don't contribute it in an open way to the public to be able to use either in a raw data format or even in a boiled up format. There are some exceptions. Uh, you know, companies like Akamai, Cisco does a great job of it, but, um, but the, uh, the operators don't. Um, and so we're proposing changing that as, a, as part of an initiative that, that should hopefully develop over the, over the next year. Would love your comments on our thoughts. There's a paper that we've posted. I'm going to give you the web address. It's g.co forward slash IGF 2015. Uh, g.co forward slash IGF 2015, and we would love your comments. The second point is on the question of what is universal coverage, and, and I, uh, we, we've thought a lot about this too. One of the things that, um, that has, it, it constantly amazes me is that you know, we're dealing with a moving target, first of all. Second of all, there's very little discussion around who we're trying to cover. Yeah. And uh, there's some really interesting statistics. I need to look at a paper we wrote, and I'll have to pitch that again here in a second, but I'm looking at a paper we wrote where we tried to break this down. So how many, how many uncovered people are there? How many people don't have access to the internet? Well, if there's 7 billion today, there's about, uh, in the world, there's about uh, 4 billion that don't, approximately. Um, now, but if you're really trying to figure out, you know, how to cover those next 4 billion and try to get to universal coverage, just take that for a minute, you really have to project forward and you have to take into account population growth. Because by the time, you're not going to build a network tomorrow. And so we did some interesting analyses, I thought they were interesting, where you look at some of the markets like Asia, uh, which uh, um, in 2010 had a population of, uh, this is broadly defined Asia, 4.2 billion. Um, and in uh, 2030, well, is anticipated, based on current growth rates, to have a population of 4.9 billion, um, you know, representing 47% of the world's growth. In, the Afri in Africa, uh, which had in 2010 a population of, of 1 billion, will have 1.6 billion. Uh, in 2030. And so when you're talking about universal coverage, you're talking about a system that's going to cover the people that aren't, that aren't here yet, but that are coming very quickly. Um, now, who are those people? I'm not going to belabor this too much, but there's a, there's a lot of people that we will just won't cover initially. Uh, some of the, I mean, there's a lot of, when you think about the, these numbers, there's a lot of babies, a lot of young people, and so kids under, 
you know, 13, I think you can presume, aren't going to be direct users of the internet, although they may be using you know, the internet of things and, and increasingly becoming participants themselves. Um, but you also have a billion people in the world that are illiterate. Hopefully they'll use the internet in some way, but that requires a significant investment in, uh, in tools to be able to make, those, uh, make the internet accessible and, and usable for, 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 for that group of people. And while there are initiatives taking place that, that, that make that a lot better, I think by and large, um, I think unfortunately for the most part, it's not a focus area. It's not something that the, um, the companies are generally focusing on primarily because it's expensive and uh, it's unfortunate, but it's something that we need to address because it's certainly part of the group. So it, we've broken this down in a, in, a, in, a, in a paper. If you're interested in sort of seeing what that is, I, I, um, our, our sense is that we have about, we're gonna have about four billion people that we need to cover out of the total five over the course of the next, uh, over the course of the next, um, over the course of the next uh, 20 years, essentially. Um, but that there's gonna be a significant percentage that we just won't uh, cover, nor will we even care about covering to some extent, because they'll count as statistics, but we won't count you know, subscriptions of babies, for example, and yeah. others that can't use it. And so, but anyhow, it's a statistic I wanna bring out. So I have one other quick point. How do people use the internet as the technology to deliver it? And I just wanna ask a question. Is, um, is there anybody here whose first internet experience ever was on a mobile phone? Raise your hand. Well, I'm not going to pick on you and ask you questions. I'd just like to know if there is. No, that's, uh, that's interesting. So, so what we're seeing, uh, the studies that we're seeing, is that in the, in the, in the Global South primarily, um, by and large, the most, um, you know, the, the, the first experience that people are having on, a, on the Internet is through a mobile phone, not through the way that we all have done it, which is through a computer. It completely changes the dynamic. Uh, and that certainly, that certainly drives the kinds of uh, technologies. And I, as we continue, I'd love to talk about some of the, some of the other forms that are out there, but I, I want to leave the uh, microphone time for somebody else right now. Yeah. Anyone else want to chime in on this? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I think the question of how we define access um, is really important, and universal access as well. It ties into the issue of affordability, which you hinted at, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Um, one of the ways in which uh, affordability has typically been uh, defined, uh, especially at, at the global level, is, in, is, a, is looking at cost as a proportion of income, right? Um, the, the, way the UN Broadband Commission set up a target uh, several years ago where they defined uh, affordability in terms of uh, having a 5%, uh, the cost should be a 5% of average monthly income. And there they use GNI per capita to define average monthly income. So, um, we, in our own research through the affordability report that we published everywhere, um, in, in last year's report, pointed out that only 23 of 51 developing countries were able to achieve this target. However, when we think about the target, the target loses what's called an entry level package. It's a 500 megabit, megabit uh, package, right? So we should consider, now that we're talking, as, as Chris mentioned, what, what is the usefulness of these different packages and how important they are. Is 500 megs um, useful at, for, let's say, within a month? Is that sufficient for one month's use of, of internet? This is, the, this is the definition that's currently used, and I would argue that we need to like, uh, reconsider what the definition should be of what, you know, what are we calling affordable, right? Speed is another important question. Um, <clears throat> so, we should think about the, the entry, what we're calling an entry level package, and we should also, in tie to that, think about what this tar measure, uh, this threshold should be. Is 5% really uh, uh, a useful threshold, especially in light of increasing income inequality within countries? Yeah. Um, just talking about some of the definitions, uh, the government of India has already tried to put some definitions around this. So if you look at uh, what's enshrined in what we call National Telecom Policy 2012, uh, the government says universal access means anybody who demands or who wants one has it. And now they've enshrined that in the license conditions for the operators. So already if you're rolling out 3G, 4G, you have to hit what we call you know, the block headquarters, which is pretty much at the rural level. And so the government's uh, policy says is that by 2020, there ought to be 650 million of the population that has access to the internet connectivity. Uh, in terms of the quality, it says two megabits per second, right? Where are we today? 512 kbps. And the issue now becomes 
with regard to the quantum, right, of going from 650 onwards, the density of the population and the geography, the question is how do you get there, right, from 512 to get to two. We are presently, if you look at the average spectrum allocated per operator, it's anywhere from 12 to 15 mega, uh, to megahertz compared to a global average of anywhere from 45 to 50. So here's the magnitude of the problem. Right. And increasingly what the government has is this sort of schizophrenia which says, yeah, we want all this, and we've defined it as this in terms of the speeds and the quality, and continuously starve the industry from the resources to get there. And okay. so that's the challenge. Can I, it's, it's really interesting, and I just want to ask how much, so one of the important things here, of course, is the sort of interplay between uh, the policies and, uh, and, the act, and the reality. So it's one thing to, if, if you st set the standards too high, if you set uh, uh, deployment standards at 100% and, and at a very high uh, level, of, uh, very high speeds, for example, um, presumably, that at least on certain dimensions, that costs a lot more to uh, to deploy. Um, and if it's a market in which there isn't necessarily demand for, for for that, it may be very difficult to recoup your costs. So, so you, you said that that it's the, that some of the, your carriers are having trouble accessing the spectrum required to achieve the government's uh, standards. But how many of them have are feel like they wouldn't dare pay for it in the first place even if it were available because they couldn't possibly recoup at least within a reasonable time frame recoup the investment if they have to deploy with the standards that government is uh, is requiring so if you look at the experience in the last uh, two auctions you will notice that operators in india paid 1.3 times 130% of the global asking price, auction price of spectrum, right? So here's the metrics again, try to sort of uh, parameterize what the question you're answering, right? We pay global prices for our network equipment, right? Because just about 95% of it is imported, right? We pay 130% of spectrum, and we get two and a half bucks of average revenue per user. Now you talk about trying to make right. economics work, but yet today, a billion of our people are connected on voice telephony. One of the critical impediments is, in addition to this, is in terms of penetration of the rural landscape, is the price of the smartphone. All right, so that's going to be an additional factor because yes, you can build out the network, but in terms of the affordability, is not only the service, but the actual smartphone that now is there, and today that's a significant hurdle in terms of universal adoption. I think, you know, India and a lot of the countries in South Asia, um, Southeast Asia that got connected much earlier on are suffering also from this problem of having legacy phones in the market still. The difference is Myanmar, which uh, came online eight months ago when nobody was connected pretty much, and suddenly 67 of the of 67% of the phones that are being used are actually smartphones. So it's a quantum leap that they're making, and it's not a surprise that given that experience of the phone that they have, that these people are sort of, what, 50% of the Sims are accessing the internet on a daily basis, right? So it's a completely different thing. Whereas we are struggling to get, you know, the legacy phones, the feature phones passed down from the man of the household who gives it to the female who then passes it on to the child. This is like third generation phones, phones still in the market and that's a problem. And I think the problem with this def definition of universality is countries either set it too high, as Rajan was pointing out, or just too low. And there really isn't mechanisms in our policy processes to continuously keep calibrating this, right? Like, how, am I keeping abreast with my peer group of countries. That's, nobody does that really, right? OECD in their reports occasionally actually look at the high end and the low end, and, but developing countries don't do that. We set a bar and then we try to reach it. Either we achieve it really quickly in the case of MDGs, which are set too low, or set it so high that nobody can achieve it. And this is a real problem because we don't calibrate. And it has to change with available technology because if you get the regulation right, the per unit cost of deploying the next generation of technology, the per unit cost, should be cheaper. 
point out that um, listening to this discussion and looking to the material that we have been looking from the point of view of academia, what we see is that uh, when we discuss this issue of universal deployment, we also need to understand the mandates that different countries have in their constitutions or in their parliamentary rules on how they should implement universal access. In many countries, this is a decision that is made at governmental level. Even if they lose money, they have the obligation to provide that network. The question there comes, for example, in the case of Latin America, and in particular, my country, Peru, for example. How do you get the returns? Then is when you see this conflict between what is the mandate given to the state to provide to every citizen access by human rights to internet access versus the business practices that are local and global. When you see that, the question comes is, so we are giving universal access, what for? And we have to differentiate between the services that are state-based services versus the commercial services. What the users want versus what the state is supposed to provide. In the middle, it's a vortex. And this is the borders where there are the trade-offs. And from there comes the definitions of what we should provide, which is speed, which is standard. And I think that when we look to all of that, what we see is that there are a conflict between three different perspectives of what universal uh, deployment means. One is a, an issue of normative principles of constitution in countries, the internet culture that comes with the, cult, the companies that are going to provide the services, but also the telephony side of this, the uh, decisions to do uh, a build up of infrastructure or to use mobile infrastructure or satellite infrastructure when there are other dynamics in place. Okay, so um, uh, we're going to come back to, to those, all of these issues as well. Um, what I, the next thing that, that I, I wanted to address, and we've talked about it a little bit in what we've talked about so far, uh, but in particular, I, I'm interested in getting out on the table uh, some, some of your perspective on the types of technology that are being used to uh, expand the deployment of, uh, of internet access. Um, Patrick, I, I'm interested in hearing from you, Vicky as well, um, and to the extent you can tie this back to the point you made about anticipating the uh, evolution uh, as, as you know, the population grows, I, I think that's really essential, I, it was a very interesting point, and uh, in particular as we are evaluating the efficacy of, uh, of both policies and, and private sector investment and, and, and business decisions, um, I think it's crucial to, th to, to bear in mind that, that we shouldn't be hamstrung by a snapshot, uh, that we really should consider the, that this is a very dynamic market, um, and, but it's hard, right? I mean, it's particularly hard for policymakers uh, to an anticipate what the consequences of, uh, of policy may be, what, whether the current trajectory of investment, uh, both in terms of amount and the types of technology, it will fulfill their, the, their uh, government's policy objectives. It's difficult, but I think necessary to think of it in dynamic terms, and, and maybe you have some thoughts about the relationship between the types of technology that we're, we're seeing, uh, the constraints on the, that, on the technology today, and how, nevertheless, in the long run, those constraints will seem less significant because of what the technology can offer. And in particular, I, I'd like Patrick and Vicky to talk about this, but, but everyone should. I start because I have some comments about satellite that, that Vicky can then jump in and keep me honest on because I, uh, I'm not a satellite specialist. But we did spend some time thinking about this. One of the reasons for this is that there's a lot of confusion that we find among regulators. When you speak to regulators who uh, sometimes even come from the technology space but not necessarily from the, you know, the various different kinds of applications, they just don't understand them. And, there's, and it gets worse when you get down to the politicians and people that aren't in technology. Everybody wants a signal technological solution. That technological solution is often wireless. Okay? So everybody thinks that wireless is going to solve it all. Um, so you know, let's just have more wireless and more spectrum, which is certainly one thing. Or maybe satellite will solve it all. Um, and, and that's great, but there is no panacea. There is no, there is no solution for the world, for the world's interconnection. So uh, this is one of the things we also tried to do in our paper. We really tried to spend some time thinking about this together with uh, David Reed at the University of Colorado. He presented this at uh, some of the findings here at the IGF last year. 
and another colleague, Jennifer Haroon. And what we came up with was this, was this proposal of how technologies, the best fit technologies for different kinds of environments. And it's essentially uh, in the urban environments, in really dense city environments, fiber is the best thing you can get. It's not, you're not going to find uh, a large, you'll, you'll find some examples of of point-to-point of -point microwave links. You'll find people that use their mobile phones for, for access. Everybody does that, obviously, in this city. But, but you're, not, you're not watching videos. You're not really having your full experience on any of those things. And the, uh, the, fi the, the microwave links is still, uh, just hasn't really, uh, it's, it doesn't scale well because you're using frequencies that are very high and don't penetrate walls. And so what it really comes down to is fiber is the best solution for urban environments. And it's always going to be um, because it's because it's cheap, you can scale it, and um, uh, you know once it's in, you really have a, a, a product that that is uh, timeless in ways that a lot of other uh, network installations aren't. When you move out of the urban environment into the suburban environment, those areas that are don't have the tall buildings, you have a few more opportunities. And in that in that case, in the suburban area, we see satellite as being increasingly uh, possible as a as a as a, as a really good uh, substitute uh, or complement or potentially substitute for fiber. Uh, because it's cheaper, uh, and you have opportunities. Thank you. Yeah, maybe you turn yours off. Well, yeah. thank you. So, in, in the in a, so with with satellite, you see uh, you have a lot of you have a lot of economies of scale because you don't have to you know, install things in the right of way. And in the suburban environment, you're in a great place because you don't have a lot of density. When you when you have a lot of density and what engineers call clutter. Uh, Wireless just does not perform very well because it needs to have, in some way, a line of sight. Now, when you get to the rural areas, this is in, in many ways what we're talking about in all of, not all of Africa, but in a lot of places that are, you know, we, that we deal with there. It's just, just a very rural environment, and the economics are, are very difficult to, to, uh, to motivate a private sector in, investor. Uh, and so there, I think you have a much more of a, of a, of a mix. Satellite is, is the natural first choice in those markets because with a satellite system, uh, you don't have to install the fiber. Uh, you have power problems that you need to address that are very significant, extremely acute. In the case of Africa, if you take if you take South Africa out of the mix, because South Africa has a fairly uh, co complex infrastructure, but so but Africa overall is powered by the same amount of power that powers the country of Spain. An average uh, an average citizen in Africa has enough electricity to power one 60 watt light bulb for a day. That's it. And it, the power is not increasing. And so this is a real problem and something to be taken into consideration when we talk about you know, places like Myanmar that are looking more at smartphones. You know, they're not going to have uh, opportunities to just keep those smartphones charged all the time. So some very practical things to keep in mind. But we have seen that um, counterintuitively in, uh, in the case of India, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a power company that has been working very closely with the telecom companies as an anchor tenant in order to increase the grid. And they've created power mini grids that are based on partnerships with, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the cellular provider. And it's, so it's the internet, ironically, and a lot of uh, counterintuitively in many ways, it's the internet that's bringing power to the communities, not, uh, not, not the other way around. Thank you. Um, Patrick's comments on, uh, earlier comments, first of all, on this number of population moving also applies to technology because technology changes as well. And um, you mentioned satellite is um, very often the best opportunity for connecting suburban or rural areas because it's cost effective and it covers a very large um, area uh, very quickly, instantaneously almost. Um, the problem that has historically uh, present itself with satellite is the one that Jeff talked about in the beginning, which is, you know, what's sufficient? Because often it is slower, it's uh, less throughput, so it is a, you know, less quality service, perhaps. Um, as the technology has moved on, one of the things that O3B, which stands for the other three billion, has developed is a technology that is in effect a replacement for fiber. It is higher throughput on the order of the lower end of fiber and it is lower latency. Um, and so one of the things that we find when we talk to administrations and governments that are looking at universal service and so forth is we have to do quite a bit of market education on how the technology has moved forward because 
there's, there is a little bit of a paradigm shift there. So I think there's a number of places where things are shifting. The population, you have to project out for the population. And even harder, because you don't know how it's going to develop, you have to be abreast of the new technologies and take those into a account as well. So uh, uh, one question I have following up on, on that in particular is um, how often you find that uh, the policymakers are not technology agnostic, I guess, um, and in what context do, do, does that happen? I mean, on, on the one hand, you could imagine that comes up in the context of various forms of subsidies that they're just not available for, for uh, satellite. On the other hand, and, and, and I, I'm more curious and concerned about uh, when, when policies are dependent on, for example, the idea of a certain extent of, uh, of broadband deployment, but it's not considered uh, either not measured or, or not considered sufficient because of certain characteristics of it. And uh, there could be any number of other contexts in which this happens. Uh, I'd love to hear some about your experiences with that. And maybe if you have some thoughts about, you know, I mean, other than technology agnosticism, how to deal with them. So, yes, you're right. Um, so the, the one and probably, you know, perhaps the most obvious is uh, in the satellite world, you have both commercial satellites and you have government satellites. So if you're in a, a country where there are government satellites or there's plans for government satellites, but they aren't there, you may find that uh, you have a, a barrier to entry even if there is only a plan for a national satellite. Uh. So that can slow deployment. Sure. Um, we also find that, you know, usually a universal service obligation comes with a string attached of some sort um, to the use of spectrum. And we often will be talking both to um, the, the telcos because we don't serve the end user, we serve the telcos and the internet service providers. Um, and we're talking to the government administrations and we, we will already have an existing story where the operators will be telling the government they cannot afford uh, a rural deployment because it's too expensive to put fiber there. Mm -hmm. And um, we go in and say, well, actually, it isn't all that expensive and yeah, there, there is an option for affordability here. And we, we have had some success in partnering and with, with that kind of an education. Um, and then, of course, the, the governments that, you know, look to support shared infrastructure, shared tariff structures, and things like that. Um, sure. and, and it's rarely a silver bullet. It's usually some um, willingness to accept a new technology and understand the cost structure. And, and then understand what the government needs to do in terms of um, fostering shared in infrastructure and whatever subsidies. Okay. Christopher, please. So there are uh, policymakers who fall in love with technologies. Um, you saw in Europe for a long period of time, actually the media was getting behind this notion of ultra broadband. They grew quite fascinated with fiber. Uh, what's really interesting to me is from a policy standpoint as analysis, heterogeneity is that first is the countries that emphasize fiber to the exclusion of everything else had the worst rural build-outs in Europe. It's no, no big surprise. And it's pretty clear to me within a country you should see a mix of technologies, you know, leveraging the legacy. But what else is just really interesting is um, uh, two countries, two of the largest countries in Europe, the UK and Germany, are basically uh, foregoing fiber for VDSL. And uh, there was a quote from a, an EU, uh, a UK regulator that said, look, I can get 100 meg or 50 meg to 80% of my country, or I can get a gig to 20% of my country. And when the 20% the I'd reach with the gig already have the best service. And it's an interesting, tough trade-off that people make, understanding that, yeah, everyone would love a gig. I'd love a gig. Um, but it's just a question of how, to, how you have to make that work. Now, the funny thing that really struck me is, uh, the thing I love about the IGF is I've learned what happens in the, develop, the developing world. What I'm learning is that the developed world has some problems too. There are some people who are trying to wire Native American communities in the US, hyper-rural communities in the US, with unlicensed spectrum and wireless ISPs. And they face a whole different set of challenges in terms of what they can do, and they manage their networks very differently because they have so little bandwidth available to them. 
And there was a great experiment in the UK where they were trying to wire an entire city based on secondary access to Wi-Fi, private Wi-Fi, where you would get a discount from BT in return for making it open to other people. And what we're seeing is a huge amount of experimentation. And the, thing I, the example I like about some of the developed world examples is sometimes they say it's a problem of capital markets and capital formation. In these places, that's not the problem. The problem is even no matter where you are, no matter where you, what country your, state, your country is in, there's going to be part of your population that's going to be hard to reach. And we are finding all kinds of new ways to reach them. And one of the great things I think the IGF, this whole, this IGF was designed to get submissions to collect those stories. They got 80 of them. And then for 2,000 plus, um, I'll tell you, the secretary was hoping for more with the number of people attending. This is a great opportunity for the IGF to, to draw together the stories and begin to leverage them in more important ways. When you look at the um, situation in India, Jeff, um, first of all, let's just make sure we're talking satellite last mile, no satellite, because yeah. that's uh, precluded by regulation, right? First question they ask you when you land is, do you have a satellite phone? You better mark no. All right. So now we're talking middle mile or backhaul, right? So today, uh, principally, a microwave is used in the middle mile because it's just next to impossible to dig up the streets in the urban areas and put fiber in there. No matter how hard you try, right away is near impossibility. The costs go through the roof. So we're struggling with this issue of E-band and other bands in the 30 gig uh, band. And those are discussions that are being held presently in terms of how do we go in there. And the government of India says it's very neutral in terms of technology, but we're going to about to spend, or in the process of spending 20 billion US, and still counting, to put fiber right down to the panchayat level, right? So this is something that's going on. And at the same time, we have, quote unquote, all of these trials going on. So Facebook is there with its planes up there, all right? And then there's uh, satellites that, uh, you know, is being considered out there. But even for, that, even for last month? Yeah, last month, last month. And the use of white space now uh, jumping into the fray in terms of saying, oh, well, let's try and use this in combination with Fi-Fi uh, as a mix and match type uh, technology to see what we can do to start reaching the urban or rural areas at uh, affordable rates. One of the caveats that I say we've got to be very careful about in India is that 65% of our population today is in our rural areas. But the demographic trends show that that is moving into the urban areas. So you're going to ask us to start building out infrastructure when the demographic trend is in the opposite direction. So some of these uh, an anomalies uh, need to be kept in mind in terms of where we start deploying and where we start investing. Yeah, well, again, I, you know, I think that understanding and being mindful of the dynamics is, uh, is, is crucially important. And it gets to, to what, I, what I want to talk about next. I think it follows on from this. So if somebody was hoping to talk about what we were just talking about, I think we'll be in the same vein, uh, which is um, uh, the sort of hidden cost of, of government policies that uh, may be perfectly well-intentioned, uh, usually they are well-intentioned, they may be intended to achieve so the, 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 the government's policies with respect to broadband deployment and yet do it in such a way that it actually constrains broadband deployment. Uh, and I also want to talk about uh, regulations that are intended to achieve, achieve some other purpose, but nevertheless, that's related. Let's not talk about healthcare or something like that. But, but the, you know, related policies uh, that may nevertheless curtail broadband deployment because of the, the in particular, the, not, I shouldn't say in particular. One of the things we'll talk about is the interaction of supply and demand. Uh, uh, but there are any number of aspects of this, right? So uh, I, I had a list of, uh, you know, sort of primary sources of impediments to, to optimal deployment. I, we can all contemplate what that list looks like. I think number one is probably construction costs, and, and, and it's important. I don't mean to imply that that's somehow a, um, um, a, 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 you know, a problem to be overcome. It is what it is. It's reality. You actually have to take costs as given sometimes. They'll change, but you have to, as we talked about before, you have to define optimal with respect to, to costs in many cases that you can't avoid. But there are costs that in theory you can avoid, and I stress in theory, uh, because we know how politics works. Uh, but so there are, are regulatory costs, there, there are problems of, uh, of 
uh, interconnection, interoperability, particularly internationally. Uh, Mike's going to speak to that. There are also these demand side costs, uh, like lack of information, lack of, of demand. The lack of demand may, may be relative to what the government wants, right? It may be the government wants to build gigabit fiber um, and there's no demand because there's just no demand for it. Um, on the other hand, it may be that there's no demand because, because people don't know what they could get if they actually were on the internet, um, uh, which suggests a very different policy solution to, to one if you think that the problem is just that we don't have enough uh, supply. Right. Uh, so I'd like to talk about all of those, and in some ways, I guess I would I would throw open the question I w I, because um, I don't mean to imply, Michael, for example, that because you, you're going to talk about this issue, that you think this is the most important thing. So I won't ask what do you think is the most important impediment or or sort of you know kind of hidden or regulatory cost here, um, but maybe in, in a way I'll even go down the line pass if you'd like to. Um, but I, I'd sort of like to hear from from each of you your thoughts about these, these kind of hidden or interesting, uh, underappreciated, often regulatory, but not always, uh, impediments to broadband build out. And, and in the context of, of understanding where policies might prof most profitably be directed, um, but in ways that we don't, aren't always thinking about. Um, so, and I think we'll just go down the line, but feel free to pass if you. <laughs> Okay. I can't imagine anyone doesn't have anything to say on this. So. I mean, I'll, I'll start with demand. Um, then that, that is a problem in sort of funny ways. Demand is a function of affordability to begin Obviously. with, but not the only thing that affects it. Um, and affordability is a real, real issue, even if we can agree on affordability to what. That's not even the question. Affordability to something that gets people online, and that's a problem. And I mean, as I've pointed out in other panels, you know, South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Bangladesh, we've met the Broadband Commission's affordability requirement, let's put it that way, right? We really look good on paper. Under 5% 5 5 of monthly income, uh, we have broadband packages, entry level, and people are not online. I mean, under 20% of the population is online. So even after crossing that barrier, there are other ones. Um, the availability of electricity, the fact that you can't charge your phone is a real problem in Africa in sample surveys, representative sample surveys that comes through, uh, and people are not getting a phone. Um, the availability of actual signal is still a problem in Africa. You never see that now in Asian surveys, but in African surveys, in you know, 18, 19 countries, you actually see this thing, you know, I don't get a good enough signal. Um, I don't see why I should get a cell phone you know, given that's the way people are coming online for the first time in Africa and Asia, this is really key, getting a device in their hands. I don't see why I should. I really don't see the relevance, and that's a much bigger barrier, I think, to cross. Um, when you do hear governments talking about, you know, we've built it, but they're not buying it, that usually means that the government has spent their own money, put in large amounts of fiber, uh, trying to get reach everybody's household and people aren't paying the somewhat high prices that they expected them to pay. Um, I want to take your, your supposedly irreducible case, which is um, construction costs. So, I mean, there's an old line, we depend on Moore's Law of lowering costs electronically, digitally, and uh, I read a line once, Moore's Law does not apply to digging ditches. And there's certain parts of it that don't change. but. But what's interesting is some countries have done a nice job coordinating across utilities that when someone's digging a ditch, you let the other utilities know. And uh, that's, you know, it's a funny thing, but, and, and they're gonna squabble how they're gonna divide the cost. I mean, I don't mean to make it easier than it is, but some countries have done a very nice, very effective job at just being more intentional and being more intelligent about how they do that. There's a hidden cost, which is, um, uh, there's a, I worry that people who come to places like the IGF, we get an elitist mindset, where we, we're all on the internet, and we all want it to be smartphones, when frankly, until recently, globally, it was more 50% feature phones. Why? They don't do as much, but they're cheap, you know, and the power consumption. I mean, there's a lot of things about it that are beneficial. But what I learned was, is um, people would say, oh, future-proof it. You're going to have to build fiber anyway. Anyone else is being short-sighted. What I've learned is, you know, if you look at the, the economics of it, matching your revenues with your uh, expenditures becomes critical. 
the story I'll tell you is Verizon, when they laid fiber, the first thing that happened is their stock price dropped. The second thing that happened is their bond rating dropped. That increased their cost of capital on every project they're building. They're paying interest on this from day zero. If the revenues come in fast, this is a good deal. If the revenues come in slow, it's a disaster. And so the desire to future-proofing it, if the revenues come in slow, let's put it this way. I've never had this real conversation. They don't talk about fiber anymore. They all they talk about is LTE. And so I've never heard them say this. If I had to guess, if they had to do it over again, they wouldn't do it, certainly not then, uh, or they might not do it at all. And so understanding how to make sure that you meet, you, you right-size the investment with the actual needs of the consumers is critical. Um, one of the one of the uh, costs here that is very rarely talked about, but the one that's uh, in, it's interesting to me that I think is a really relevant one is just the legal costs of deploying, hiring lawyers. How many lawyers are involved in rolling out networks? And so I'm a I consider myself a recovering lawyer. I was a uh, I was a lawyer in the telecom industry for about 18 years before I joined Google, and I'm a, and I'm very critical of of the of the of the of the, of the needs for the, the kind of work I used to do. I should, it's, it's, it, and it's unbelievable how, how complicated these laws are and how many companies need lawyers to interpret them. And then what do lawyers do once they have them? And they argue about them. They require further clarification. They require a bunch of memos. And then you got to go apply, and the lawyer's going to have to represent you in all of the application process because it's all legal. Uh, you know, it's all, you're all legally skating on the edge, and you're trying to classify yourself as, a, uh, as an Internet provider rather than a telecom provider or as a telecom provider because in one place it's better than that. It's unbelievably expensive, and, and uh, it's, a, it's, an ex it's an expenditure that we need to focus on in order to eliminate, and it's not being focused on now. Uh, so that's one thing. I don't know that there's a solution for it exactly, other than just as observe that uh, there's too many lawyers in the business. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the second is, is uh, shared infrastructure. Uh, this is a, a, a meta objective that I think uh, we, we should all, we should all uh, aspire towards, and you'd ask for examples of good policies and bad policies. I'll give one of each. Um, the advantage of shared infrastructure is important, first of all, because this is where you achieve economies of scale. This is where Moore's Law meets trenching. Uh, you know, not, in a, not in a direct way, but by, by working in a way to take advantage of technology to share existing infrastructure in new and novel ways, whether it's uh, you know, using the same piece of fiber that, that's not being lit in, in a, maybe by a couple of different people, uh, sharing conduit. Or, or just you know, recognizing that the, the, the public right-of-way, the streets that are built by the governments and the poles that, are, that the government authorized to be put in, even if they were put in by a, by a private uh, power company, are often funded by taxpayers. And they have a responsibility to open that infrastructure up to anybody that wants to uh, serve the public service. And, uh, and understanding how to do that is a, is, a, is a really important thing, and yet governments fail at it miserably. I love to pick on my home state, uh, Colorado, which passed a law that says called Senate Bill 152, which prohibits a uh, municipality from entering into a partnership of any kind with the private sector to do Wi-Fi or to do anything uh, related to broadband service deployment as part of a package of bills that were promoted by the incumbents in many different states. It's not just Colorado. And so what happens in the case of Colorado is if, uh, you know, if a company wants to work with the municipality to share the infrastructure the municipality owns, uh, this, the, the, uh, the infrastructure lobby has effectively made it that impossible unless the municipality goes and takes the whole thing to a public referendum. That kind of overhead, again, requires how many lawyers to draft the referendum to encourage everybody to do that, and most companies are just going to walk away from it. So that's an, that's an example, and these laws of, uh, you know, the, the, the prohibit or restrict uh, public-private partnerships are, are, by and large, really problematic. They're, they're everywhere, and there's opportunities to control that on the back end. So that's, that's an area of bad regulation. An area of good regulation is just quite simply uh, the, the infrastructure sharing rules, those that, that, that don't mandate sharing uh, in, in, in all cases, you need to have some flexibility in it, but, that, but to create an environment that makes it very, uh, maybe makes it well, both uh, encourages uh, incumbents to share infrastructure, but that also uh, disincentivizes bad behavior. So if you, you need to have a place to go if there's a problem. If you have a complaint and you're a new entrant in the market and somebody's stopping you, you need to be able to go somewhere uh, and resolve it and resolve it quickly. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is my last one, I'll be quick, is that we talked about dig, dig once, it alluded to it, and I think that's a good policy. But I'm a little concerned that people are over putting a, investing a little bit too much excitement in it because that really is useful uh, in new 
road construction. And that's a really big thing in places like Africa and Asia, uh, you know, where you have new roads. But in mature markets, uh, there's very little road construction. So the fanfare around, around passing those is, is, is good, but I think we need to be realistic about it because there's not, it's not going to affect a lot, of, a lot of new people. I think you need to think about it as dig smart instead. Um, in my experience, and I have no, inf I have no actual data to support this. It's anecdotal, but I think it'd be good for you know if there are some academics that are interested in looking at this. I think that uh, what I've experienced in the past is that as a representing a competitive telecommunication provider trying to enter a market with these digs, what I'm calling dig smart policies, what the municipality will do is and say, hey, you know, there's a company that comes and wants to dig, and they alert everybody else, and so the incumbents have used that as a way to delay. They're saying, no, we need more time, we need to set time frames, and delay kills network deployment, just like uh, lawyers do and everything else. And so the delay issue associated with some of these, hey, we're going to build, can really be a problem. And it shouldn't be a problem theoretically, but it is in practice from my experience. And so I think it could be fixed by, you know, by constraining those, by, 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 by enabling that, enabling those discussions, even requiring that there be notice to others when there's a new infrastructure project taking place, but limiting the amount of time making it a short window so that it's not used as a tool to delay. So I'll, I'll just talk a bit about um, the cost of international transit. And I'll start with a plug for Patrick's paper, um, because one of the fact features of this is that it's very hard to find out what are the costs of international transit. Um, it's in the private sector hands. It, Telegeography and the big um, companies that gather data don't really focus on, on developing countries. Um, so it's very hard to get that data um, uh, for starters. So I would highly recommend looking at that paper and, and that the industry should start thinking about ways to, to gather this data so that the governments and everyone else can, can see what the costs are, not just international transit, but international transit. So this morning I had to email a colleague in Kenya who had to email someone and got a, a current rate of maybe $100 per megabit second, which is kind of hard to conceive of until you think like a 4G connection can download 20 megabits per second. It's not a great translation, but it's pretty easy to use up a, a one megabit per second and $100 per megabit per second per month. That's qu quite expensive. And that's particularly an issue um, in countries where 80 or 90 percent of traffic can be international. So almost all the traffic is coming international, and that adds a significant amount of cost. But there's a second issue that's also um, kind of a little more subtle, and that is uh, in economics, if something's expensive, you try and get less of it. Um, so you're going to under-provision your international uh, to the extent that you can. So you're adding a lot of latency. Um, so you've got high cost and, and things coming over during peak times especially are going to be quite slow because you don't want to provide enough so everyone can, can do Netflix on, on their mobile phones in, in these countries where costs are so high. So the interesting thing I think is that there's a, you know, a pretty established set of things that governments can do to lower this cost. Um, you know, first of all, don't just have one cable coming in that's owned by the incumbent in a consortium who gets, who has the only license. I mean, these things are pretty well understood, but I think the, the issue now is Kenya is one of the countries that gets it. Um, there's four cables coming in, um, none of them owned just by a, a monopoly. Um, a lot of ISPs are licensed to take the capacity. There's open access to at least one of those cables. And they still have high prices. They've done everything that pretty much, as far as I know, that you're supposed to do to lower those prices. And it still hasn't fully lowered them. So you have a high fixed cost um, thing, right? You can't lay part of a cable until demand catches up. You have to lay the whole thing, and you lay a lot of fibers. So it's just clearly you know, not enough volume. It must be. Um, so the, you know, that's a hard one to solve, right? The government can't just suddenly, and nobody can suddenly just say, get more volume and your prices will come down. So the things that we do at the Internet Society is um, to, to help with this are, you know, get com countries to put in IXPs to localize traffic so it doesn't go over the international connections. And it's also, of course, much faster to connect if you're not tromboning across international connections. Uh, we're starting to look at local content hosting as a way to localize more traffic. Um, and these are great solutions because not only do they lower the cost and the need for the international, but they also lower the latency and allow you to watch YouTube videos 
and, and, and everything else, especially when they start to be cached locally. Um, and we've seen that because the, um, the latency comes down, usage goes up, and we were doing a project on this in Rwanda on local hosting, and uh, at the time that we were doing it, Akamai put a cache of uh, content in Rwanda, and they shared the numbers, and within two months, just purely by putting the cache locally, usage of their content doubled. So in two months, people responded just because it was faster, they used more of it, usage doubled within two months just by hosting it locally. So those are great solutions, but ultimately, of course, that doesn't solve the, the volume problem. In fact, it, it lowers the reliance on, on the international transit. So I think everything else we've been discussing here will get to the long-run solution of increasing broadband availability and usage and starting to build up the volumes. So even if more and more is coming from local solutions, the whole pie is growing and, and there's more coming over the international. Um, but here it's one of those areas that I think you start to run into where it's not just the government that you can quickly point and say do this and do this um, and, and you'll solve your problems. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's commercial and it's other issues that are gonna take, take longer but ultimately result in a much better ecosystem. Back to the issue of the hidden costs, and uh, actually uh, pinpoint the case um, currently under development in Peru. Uh, in the north region of Peru, there is a huge area that is covered by the Amazon, and uh, in this moment, there is a plan to develop a high-speed network of mobile telephony. Um, the government has taken the initiative to run the design and the forecast for this network, and they are finding that there are all these associations with different services, like electricity companies, etc., to reduce the cost. But one of the uh, issues that is uh, been difficult to estimate is the environmental cost of the installation of these antennas. Because since this is an area where there is no proper main supplies of electricity, so most of these antennas will run with petrol, and this petrol will have to be transported to the generators that will be next to the stations. And these are costs that also are seen in India. And um, this is something that is not discussed. You know, the actual carbon footprints and the offsets of installing all these mobile net masks around in, very, in areas of extreme beauty that are national parks in many cases, and the environmental costs. But more interesting than that is that uh, in the case of Peru, for example, uh, the government had made this mandate and is making uh, assumptions about the consumption of the, of the services that potentially can be provided over these networks based on very low uh, consum uh, user consumption. What we all know from the experience is that this is gonna be very fast as soon as people start using the services and if they can afford them, or is subsidized to them, as is the plan of the Peruvian government, people will start using it more and more. So in, a, in the next three or five years after the network is activated, it will be necessary to expand it. Uh, and the model is very uh, difficult to um, understand because um, there is this huge investment that is being made by loans for international organizations that Peruvian taxpayers will pay. However, the, uh, the way that they, go, they plan to recover the money uh, is to give this management of the network to international companies that have the infrastructure to control the network. It's not clear how the money will be returned, and that makes huge questions about the future of how the networks will be expanded. So um, there is a discussion here open to understand in many developing countries this idea of uh, implementing networks, how the regulators work, um, how this relates to the actual investment in future networks, and I think that this is, this is an assumption that many people that live in developing countries, in developed countries and have access to internet do not discuss even, because this will be from the, from the outset a, a discussion that will be run by the private sector and not the government or the uh, regulators. Yes, okay, so uh, we're talking about policy options. I'd like to raise three, three quick points. Um, First, um, if we're looking at access, we have to recognize that there's a huge access gap between men and women, right? The Web Foundation recently did a report uh, using surveys in, across nine countries in um, South America, Africa, and Asia, and showed that women are 50% less likely to access the internet, um, less likely than men, for people with, with the same education, income, and age. Uh, so this is a huge problem, but we are talking about policy options in terms of governments. The thing is, we often see this as a separate issue. For example, national broadband plans, ICT policies, never typically address this kind of problem, right? And this 
we would argue is a huge opportunity when we're thinking about national plans, national ICT policies, even regulations, guidelines, and so on. What are the options here to address the access gap between men and women? Um, the second point, um, still on governments, is the issue of taxation. Um, in, in developing countries where, where we focus our work, taxation of ICTs is often seen as a, as a, luxury, a luxury good, right? And they're often taxed at that level. The problem is there is, there is an interest in short-term revenue from the government side um, that overlooks the long-term benefits of increased ICT diffusion, increased diffusion from mobile phones and internet access. And there are lots of studies that have shown that there are huge social economic benefits from accessing these technologies. So this is another problem. So the, the issue is not to say that these types of ICTs and so on should not be taxed. Taxation is required. It's just that what's required is a more balanced, informed kind of fiscal policy with regard to uh, ICTs. And then um, the third point is on infrastructure sharing, which, which, Patrick, which Patrick mentioned. Another area and a very important way of that this occurs is through uh, sharing of tower infrastructure, right? And this is, this is a, a not a big opportunity for the operators themselves. Um, one, one study that was done by the APC um, focused on Africa argued that two operators sharing the same tower infrastructure could, could, it could represent 45% of the cost of a single operator deployment. And if they, they argued that if, if all the forecasted 15,000 towers throughout the continent were, were done on a tower sharing basis with at least two operators, the total cost savings could be in the range of 675 million US dollars. So the, the cost savings are huge because it can lower industry costs, which ultimately in a competitive environment can mean lower prices for consumers, which is what, which is what they ultimately we want. So I think those are three key points that we should keep in mind. Thank you. First of all, um, a data point. Uh, as far as uh, our operators are concerned, probably globally, the issue is not one of demand, it's one of being able to translate the demand into you know, monetized value, right? We, we have more demand than we know what to do with, and we can't keep up with the investments that are required to keep up with the demands that are put on our network. That's the first thing. The second thing is that India pioneered a lot of this sharing, so we were one of the first to start infrastructure sharing vis-a-vis -vis our TARS, passive, now we're going to active, so uh, we have a tenancy ratio of close to two. We have about 500,000 TARS throughout the country, uh, and so that is something that the government, as a result of, infra of spectrum sharing and trading, that has just been introduced allows now for uh, pass uh, active infrastructure sharing on the uh, TARS as well, so that's happened. The biggest uh, challenge that we as operators have is the 30% that we pay for every dollar of revenue that we get that goes back to the government. Government sees us as a uh, cow that can be milked at random. It uh, gives the government a quick fix in terms of revenue. Uh, somebody noted, uh, I don't know how accurate this is, but they said 100 basis point adjustment in the Reserve Bank of India prime rate does not get them as much as a 1% increase in terms of taxes on the mobile operators. Why is that? We have 1 billion connections. So you can do the math. You can see how quickly that translates into revenue for the government by just even a quick one. Just last two, three days ago, the government decided they were going to fund the Swachh Bharat, which is the Clean India campaign, by a half a percent increase in terms of a cess or a tax on the uh, telecom uh, operators, including uh, air, uh, air transportation and others. So the point here is this, the large amount of money that goes back into the government and is used for other than universal service obligation uh, programs. So this is, you know, a Robin Hood type of stuff here. So that's clearly a challenge that uh, we are facing. Third, very quickly, I just want to show the sort of um, in unintended consequence of a regula regulation in India. In India, and as was the case in other parts of the world, electromagnetic fields pose a significant scare in India. Nobody wants a tar near their house or in their backyard, right? Because they're afraid that this causes cancer and all kinds of health hazards. So the government, listening to the public outcry, decided that they were going to reduce these EMF levels, right, from the global standards, which are set by WHO slash ICNEP, by 90%. Everybody thought they were going to feel safe. This increased <laughs> the uh, concern among the citizens. 
it increased the number of tasks that are required because obviously uh, when you uh, reduce uh, the power consumption to reduce the EMF consumption, it requires more tasks. It requires 10% to 12% more tasks on average because of uh, the dynamics involved. So here is the unintended, gave no useful health benefit, by the way, that is documented, right? But yet, posed a considerable cost on the industry and is still today a cause for some of the problems that we have in terms of call drops in India and getting the network back on its feet. Thank you. So um, kind of pulling a few of these things together because being um, a commercial operator, of course, for us, um, our, our willingness to put out services is driven by demand, it's a function of demand. Um, often, and we, we talked about this a little bit, um, uh, you know, demand is a function of availability too. Because if, to your point, if you have never experienced something of value on a mobile phone, why do you need a mobile phone? Um, so it's a little bit cyclical, but picking up on the last point as well, um, one of the challenges is to get that ecosystem right, to get all of the uh, behaviors and drivers for the government, for commercial industry, um, you know, for the citizenry aligned properly um, because we've, we've also worked on a number of these um, places where there was a universal service obligation and seen that either that the universal service funds get collected from the operators but they don't get appropriately distributed to subsidize the build out of the infrastructure or the flip side, which is, which is also bad, they do get distributed and they never get cut off. So there's, there needs to be an incentive to build out the infrastructure in places where otherwise it would not be economic for an operator to do, but not to forever subsidize it so that they build a, a robust business that makes them an acceptable you know, profit and that funds further build out, not a continual government subsidy. Two points. I think, Rajan, you're being quite generous when you say you only have a problem with, um, you know, the uh, USO funds being used for other purposes. I actually have a fundamental problem with USO funds. If connectivity is a meritorious good, which is why we've decided to subsidize it, it should probably come out of general taxation. And over time, the percentage contribution should go down. That's made by the companies. No countries have that. We have fixed amounts. Um, and that's partly because the general taxation regime is so weak that governments, it's much easier to squeeze the five, six, two, one telecom companies by six places to tax instead of the 700 million people that we don't have tax files for, right? Um, but some other thing that we haven't um, talked about, and Michael really touched on this cost of international connectivity, and that we see this when we do quality of service testing for broadband across Asia in multiple cities, multiple times of the day, is that when you're downloading content from a local server in your own country ISP, you get sort of decent quality, not what's promised. But the moment you're downloading international content, your latency goes up, your throughput comes down. So this is under provisioning is a real, real problem. And the last time I looked at telegeography numbers, our costs for international bandwidth was at least six times that of transatlantic prices, right? So overall prices are coming down, but this is a problem. One of the things we haven't mentioned as one of the solutions, which you gave many, is I think IXPs, in-country internet exchange points, which in some cases have pro, uh, proven to be a reasonable thing to keep the local traffic. Local. Oh, sorry. Uh, so we're coming up on the end here, and I wanted to give an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions. I, I, I am told that uh, for those watching remotely, we can field questions through some mechanism. Uh, remotely as well. Um, I don't know, I guess there are microphones on the sides here uh, would be good for questions. And, and while you're coming up, I wanted to amplify one thing that you said, Vicky, that to me is essential to understanding the economics of deployment of, of networks in general, is that, that like, this again goes to the dy dynamic issue uh, um, there's a very different set of incentives, a very different set of, of optimal investment when you are building your, the, you know, at, the, at the beginning, when you are trying to build your network or build your, your platform for those 
for content providers as well, than there is uh, at the end. And um, uh, it's a real problem if policies are locking um, the network into one or the other or neglecting to understand that, that whatever incentives they may have today in terms of getting initial uh, uptake, for example, are very different than, than the incentives they'll have farther down the line. Crucial to, to understand the appropriateness of policy. Hello, am I audible? Uh, my name is Sharda. I have two uh, questions of the panel. Uh, the first is in relation to uh, policies that might be beneficial, and I wanted the thoughts of the panel on a mechanism of cross-subsidization of newer and more innovative models, such as the one that O3B is using uh, uh, in relation to newer and newer deployment. What do you think of uh, such a policy being implemented, uh, wherein you can uh, increase access, but you don't necessarily have to have as much cost as you would. Uh, there is obviously a question of who would cross-subsidize what, uh, wh who, who the incumbents would be in this paradigm, but I'm interested in your thoughts on the general principle. But the second question that I have, uh, and it'll be short, is also uh, what do you see the role of mesh networks and community-based networks in uh, this entire debate about deployment? Like, do you see them as playing a part at all? Do you think they're not a thing? Uh, I just want the thoughts. Thank you. Sit down. I have one question. Could you just get explain what you mean by cross subsidization? I don't. I don't mean. Uh, just give an example, if you so, would. So, so what I mean uh, in general is, if I am a new and innovative business, uh, not a business model, if a new, new and innovative technology that is going into a regime that does not have access to this technology at this point in time, and I will have to spend a lot of money in um, like putting up that infrastructure in that space, uh, should I be uh, subsidized by? who is a blank, uh, to be able to do that for me to be incentivized, uh, to be able to do that further? Or it, are there already incentive mechanisms for newer and newer innovative models to, uh, in terms of technology, to exist in this space? Uh, no, uh, the reason I'm asking this is because right now the pr the programs that we have in terms of innovative technologies are more often than not already run by really large uh, conglomerates like Alphabet's project Loon or O3B's pol uh, like model that they just explained. Uh, um, and I wonder uh, what that would look like if I am someone that does not have that kind of resources to invest in uh, like technology innovation uh, of that scale. Was that clear? Do you need more yes, clarity? Thank you. Thank you, yes. It kind of sounds like universal service funds, right? You raise money from one thing and put it into something else, right? Yeah. which I'm sure we'll have plenty of uh, opinions on, but otherwise, where would the cross-subsidy come from? Uh, no, so um, the, the reason why I'm not using the term universal service obligation fund is because of the way universal sub service obligation fund is practically uh, manifested in a lot of countries right now. Um, and the problems that exist there in terms of things that have already been pointed out, uh, either collection and no, like no use or uh, no understanding of what that money is being used for or like put into policies that are not necessarily helping uh, internet deployment. So do you think there is a much, like, I actually think this might be an alternative to USO models. So there's, there's two answers to this. Know. The traditional telecom cross services, you basically allow some to overcharge for one telecom service and finance the other one. We actually have a very prominent example of this in the modern world. Japan did this with fiber. And when they announced the project, the private investors screamed bloody merchants saying it's never going to pay out. The Japanese government still owns 35% of NTT. They are the controlling shareholder and say you have to do it. Uh, it turns out the private shareholders are right. It's never going to pay out. It's, it's, it's very expensive. But the harm also is they're overcharging traditional copper voice customers and making them pay for this, this uh, another technology. And the orthodox economics would say this is robbing people to pay Paul. It creates uh, secondary distortions where people will artificially curtail their phone call and you're making the fiber look artificially attractive. And it's generally, and it won't survive competition. Because whoever you're overcharging, that's where you're going to attract the competition and it's no, there's going to be no cross subsidy to begin with. What you're talking about can be something else, which is you arbitrarily go after a pot of money which you can get at. And to some extent, this is what Rajan's, um, the members of his association face, and we see this with taxes. Uh, the orthodox public finance response is, 
you should tax people if they are creating harms or receiving benefits, and you should tax them in proportion to that to internalize that. If you are, tax if you are spending money for general benefit, you should be financing that out of general tax revenues, whether it's tax or property tax, income tax, property tax, sales, whatever your general tax base is. Uh, going after a large company who's providing services in the space just because they're large generally isn't a good idea. Your last question, mesh networks have been a great dream. We've been talking about them since I've been in this business. Um, the engineers have a saying, three hops and you're dead. We've never been able to work out ad hoc net routing and networking. We're all hoping that there'll be something happening, but someone, until they find something new that'll solve this problem, just saying the word, sprinkling mesh network language on it is not going to solve the problem. We all want it to work. That's not, I'm not trying to say that. We'd love community networks to be part of the solution. We just don't know how. Yet. Yet. <laughs> and, you know, it's as. That's why it's going to be tied to a technological development that allows us to solve something, but it's not fairy dust at this point. It's a hard, real engineering problem that people are working on. We have 20 seconds in which to, to have one more question if there, if there is one. Um, uh, yes, please. Uh, hi, um, very interesting panel. I am Chennai. I'm from South Africa with Research ICT Africa, and um, I've got only got I've got one comment in terms of um, the demand side issues. Maybe it's not everyone's main concern, but I think there's been a large broadband policies looking at um, infrastructure rollout. When on the other side, the demand users, we've done research where we found people just don't know what the internet is and they've got basic education. So maybe there's a need between private sector and government to we roll out the service and you do your job in educating people. And then my second question is, is there a role for um, one of your, the panelists talked about infra, um, fiber being key for connecting urban areas, but in places like South Africa where I come from, the high density areas do not get connected with fiber because they're low income, um, crime ridden areas. So is there, role for, is there a need for government to mandate service providers to go into those areas? Or is that a role between public-private interplays to then f come up with some solution to connect people in those less lucrative areas? Thank you. Sure, sure. I'll, 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 I'll try to weigh in on this. I think that um, it's, it's always difficult to, to find the incentive to get the private sector to do something that they're not going to do if it doesn't, even, it doesn't have the same payback scale. So if I have $100 and I'm going to invest and I can choose to invest it in a, in a poor area or choose to invest in a place that's, you know, that's rich, it's obvious as a private sector I'm going to go to the rich because I need to make more money and can potentially get me to, the, to those other areas quicker. And that's very unsatisfying and appropriately unsatisfying for governments because you see this redlining taking place where uh, companies go in and carve out and serve the rich and creates a digital divide. It's a very understandable problem. Uh, I, 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 I've identified it, but I don't have, a, I don't have an easy solution. Um, I, I do believe that uh, a lot of the things that governments can do is regulation by raised eyebrow. Right? And so regulation by raised eyebrow is a, uh, is a mode of regulation that isn't actually regulation. It's, it's when you have uh, regulators that are influential or politicians that are influential ask really hard questions and threaten potential regulation. Um, so uh, there's a number of examples of, of regulation by raised eyebrow. Uh, one that comes to mind is when you think about the different kinds of uh, different kinds of connectors that are used to charge phones. Well, this, uh, this frustrates everybody, and there's you know been a couple examples of regulators say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna initiate this and regulate the hell out of it and require a certain size adapter. And of course, you know, private sector is like, oh my God, government's gonna tell me what size plug. We got our act together and figured out. Okay, well, it came up with a proposal together suddenly that makes it happen. Regulation by raised eyebrow can be effective. It's not a panacea, but, but it can work in those cases. So I have to give Patrick's company a, a credit. So one of the things that they've been able to do in areas which were perceived to be less desirable from fiber is they actually did something in business terms that's called gamification, which is they said, if you pass a certain threshold, we'll wire the neighborhood. And what they discovered is there's certain super heavy users who not only want it so bad that they'll pay, they will recruit other people to do it and become the best advocates for doing it. And we thought that it would only be high income neighborhoods that would buy. In fact, they, the dynamics worked. They did a bunch of other really interesting things such as 
they minimize their truck rolls by saying, we'll wire you once, oh, this is the day. If you don't go get on the bus now, it's not coming back for five years. And it became an incredible thing where it became momentum building. And it reduced their cost dramatically because it's provisioning house by house that's doing that. So there are strategies where you can activate these communities where they've been able to solve that. Uh, in response to the two other things, I'm not a fan of raised eyebrow regulation because it can be abused by regulators to do things that they can't otherwise legally do. Because it's immune to judicial review, it's not, you know, it's, it's a way to evade processes that can be quite dangerous. And the last thing I'll say is I want to thank you for refocusing us on the demand side. All the surveys from Brazil, from China, from Europe, from the U.S. say that you could build all the networks you want and, and solve that unless you solve the demand side at the same time, you will not get the results you're looking for. Good point to end on. Thanks everyone for coming. I want to thank the panelists for, for their uh, interesting comments. I really appreciate your time. And thank you.